Dana Miller presents the ninth Annual Obesity Conference, a practical look at obesity, diabetes, and current strategies. Featuring Julie Stanowski, MED, Low Carbohydrate Diets. Our next speaker uh, is, is Julie Stefanski. I got it right? Yeah, oh, good job. Right. <laughs> uh, Julie is the editor of Food, Nutrition, and Dietetics for Nutrition Dimension, a division of OnCourse Learning, where she coordinates more than 250 evidence-based continuing education courses on nutrition-related topics. Uh, she's been a certified diabetes educator since 2003, and she's the owner of Stefanski Nutrition Services in York, Pennsylvania, where she specializes in ketogenic diet therapies. Ms. Stefanski is a national media spokesperson for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and serves on the board of directors for the Pennsylvania Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Uh, she was an adjunct uh, instructor in the Stabler Department of Nursing at York College of Pennsylvania for 13 years. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Julie Stefanski. Thanks for having me here. Um, we've been discussing ketogenic diet a little bit uh, last night and today, and I think that this is a highly polarized topic in a lot of areas. If you look on Twitter, you can see people fight over this like religion um, nearly uh, you know, every day if you look at some of the different uh, social media opinions about this. Um, my background is as a ketogenic dietitian. I was a ketogenic dietitian for the neurology department at Wellspan Health uh, in York, Pennsylvania for um, eight years. And so I, you know, I have a my perspective, I think, has changed about use of a high-fat diet, especially in areas of obesity, in areas of migraines, um, epilepsy. But what I'm going to really go over today, I'm not going to be debating about whether we should be doing high-fat, low-carb. I'm going to present some evidence that you might want to look into. Um, but one of the things to think about, you know, when you have a patient come into your office and they've been self-administering a ketogenic diet to themselves, and they've been on it nine months, and they've lost 60 pounds, what do we need to look at to evaluate whether this person is healthy or not? And if they are going to continue with such a low-carb diet, what do we need to monitor to make sure that really their risk factors for cardiovascular disease, cancer, other issues are really addressed? So I am going to start by defining what exactly is a low-carbohydrate diet, what differs from low carb versus keto. We're going to look a, a little bit at the nutritional uh, or the differences between nutritional ketosis and ketoacidosis. Look at the major nutritional concerns when we restrict carbs to a significantly low amount and what should be the monitoring procedures if somebody is on this diet. And of course, the goal of um, encouraging you to get more avocados in your diet, right? So what is a low carbohydrate diet? There actually is no consistent definition. If we think about what a diabetes educator would typically advise someone to reduce their carbohydrates to, we may look at a low carb diet as being 60 grams of carb per meal or 75 grams of carb per meal. This would be a reduction from the dietary guidelines um, which recommend around 60% of calories from carbohydrates. When we look at a very low carb diet, we're typically talking about initiation of a diet that may be 20 grams of carb per day. You know, that's a fat slice of bread, would have 20 grams of carb per day, would be the maximum, um, up to 50 grams of carb per day. So if you keep that in mind of what would be considered more of a ketogenic diet, an adult would possibly have 10 grams of carb per meal. And so with that, many, many foods must be excluded in order to reach that minimum levels of carbs. Obviously, when we restrict carbs, there has to be another macronutrient that's going to replace that. So when we think about low carbs, a diet can either be high in protein or it can be high in fat. So uh, traditionally, a ketogenic diet is not a high protein diet. It is a high fat diet. As a reminder, uh, when you think about working with someone with diabetes, the American Diabetes Association currently does not recommend that individuals with diabetes consume less than 130 grams of carbohydrate per day. That's their current guidelines, and the way that they justify that is that they say that's the minimum amount of glucose needed for the brain. 
So we know, though, that the brain has the ability to use ketones, so it should be interesting whether this continues to stand, you know, as their guideline when we look at um, all the different guidelines, guidelines that come out for patients with diabetes. When we look at reducing carbohydrate out of macronutrients and benefits that can be seen, um, one research study that was really recently in the media and really proposed that there are benefits here, recent research by Hallberg and colleagues validated that a decreased insulin need by reducing carbohydrates led to decreased insulin resistance. Along with that, decreased blood glucose levels while following a ketogenic diet and improved insulin resistance. So we do have data supporting the change in macronutrients of reducing carbs can help factors related to good diabetes control. So definitely when we target carbs as the macronutrient reduce to reduce versus fat, we have a decrease in insulin resistance. We have a blunted blood sugar effect when a meal is made up of mainly fat as the main macronutrient. And individuals following a ketogenic diet often have mild nausea. Now, when we think about weight loss, you know, mild nausea is going to impact their interest in eating uh, meals. So some people definitely feel more satisfied on a high-fat diet, and they might actually feel a little bit nauseous, which actually leads to a lower calorie intake. So let's look at, you know, when we think about how do macronutrients um, affect blood glucose level. If we think about our main macronutrient, we always talk about carbohydrates as the best fuel. Well, it's the best fuel for active people. Whether it's the best fuel for inactive people um, is where um, you know, some of the debate lies. And if you think about someone starting out and eating, let's say that they did have a bowl of Lucky Charms. They've actually counted the carbs, restricted it, but nearly 100% of what they're eating is carbohydrate. Within about a half an hour, almost 100% of that carbohydrate will enter the bloodstream and raise the blood glucose level. So we see the highest effect on blood glucose level through carbohydrate and the quickest. So really within that hour, hour and a half, that's going to peak, you know, in their bloodstream. And of course, we need insulin then to bring that blood sugar level down. And in many of our patients, that's simply not happening. When we look at how protein affects blood glucose level, we do have an effect of protein on blood glucose. When we're thinking about maintaining ketosis, excess protein can negate ketosis. And that is because about 50% of the protein that we consume will affect blood glucose levels, but it's about half as much as what carbohydrate would affect blood glucose. And it's going to occur around three hours through gluconeogenesis. We would see that bump in blood glucose related to protein, not necessarily carbohydrate. Fat also can affect blood sugar levels, but it really has a very blunted effect um, in comparison to carbohydrate or protein. And so a high fat meal or a mainly fat meal would really, we'd see that impact around 10 hours later in the blood glucose level. Now, we're often not attributing that to a high fat meal. Um, but individuals that, if you've watched someone with a CGMS who's been on a ketogenic diet or even someone on a very high carb diet, you can see when people are peaking at different times related to what they have eaten and obviously their own uh, glucose production. Um, so one of the things when we look at the rules for diabetes control, think about the ideal diet for um, someone who has obesity. Um, one of the things in the past, you know, we know that fat affects blood glucose the least. But we often recommending still 60% of their calories come from carbohydrate. And often that's come out of the fear of long-term effects of fat on health. But yet many different meta-analyses that we've looked at are not really supporting that a high-fat diet is actually leading to some of these issues with cardiovascular disease. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit. 
So um, I'm not going to go through heavily on the research supporting why a low-carb diet might be, you know, a good choice for obesity treatment um, or treatment of diabetes, but I have some uh, different um, research studies that you might want to uh, look into. I have them in the references at the end. Um, but one really uh, great paper uh, that I really like, published in 2015 by Feynman, they really went through a lot of these points about why carbohydrate goal should be reduced for patients either with diabetes or with obesity, and some of really the misconceptions that we've all been taught um, in school about intake of fat, uh, intake of carbohydrates. And they concluded really that carbohydrate goals that we're currently um, suggesting to patients should be lower, and that there is a des desirable increase in insulin sensitivity. We know that high levels of insulin can lead to, you know, it, it's a fat storing hormone. So especially insulin is not a harmless hormone. And we know that there are benefits from bringing down fasting levels of insulin in the body. In 2017, there was a meta-analysis that was published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And they looked at 18 low-carb diet studies. Now, again, as I mentioned, we don't have a standard definition of low-carb diet. So comparing these diets sometimes is comparing, you know, eggs to avocados or apples to oranges. You know, we have um, a really a big challenge in that way because the carbohydrate amounts that people consumed in these studies are not consistent. Um, but they did conclude that 18 low-carb diet studies showed that there was reduced need for medication improved A1C, improved LDL, triglycerides, blood pressure, and include, um, included that clinical um, changes in diabetes were um, something that really they were striving for with use of these diets. In a study in cell metabolism in 2017, they actually looked at obese individuals with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and with following the low-carb diet, they had a significant reduction in liver fat, and cardiometabolic risk factors. And you may be familiar with the results from Hallberg and colleagues uh, published in 2018, where they used a low-carb ketogenic diet for a year in 330 individuals, but they were supported by extensive medical support. Health coaches, dietitians, physicians, and monitored very closely in order to do this. But at the one-year mark, 97 percent of the patients reduced or discontinued their insulin, and 58 percent no longer met the criteria for a diagnosis of diabetes. Now, why sh should we not do a ketogenic diet? In the paper I mentioned by Feynman, you know, they really pointed out that there's a high attrition rate among these diets. There's many factors that go into why someone eats the way that they do. And a ketogenic diet can be very socially isolating for someone. You know, when you think about not being able to participate in even in communion, birthday parties, celebrations of familiar foods, the pleasure factor in eating, you know, is somewhat, uh, you know, it has to be dealt with um, in a ketogenic diet. We see so many studies that support, you know, um, a very plant-based, higher-carbohydrate diet. So if you look at different studies that have used um, a very, very low-fat, more of a vegan approach, there are health benefits that are shown through those diets. Um, last night um, at the presentation, the blue zones were mentioned. And when we look at Dan Buettner's work in thinking about the areas of the world where people live the longest, they're not on a ketogenic diet. You know, they're consuming plant-based diets, but they're also getting a very high level of physical activity. Some other research looking at the sea main population of South America, um, some research has, researchers have looked at this indigenous hunter-gatherer population and pointed out that their diet is 72% carbohydrate, so much higher than Americans, and that they have the lowest reported rate of chronic disease out of any group studied. Now, in the paper that I looked at, there was no mention of their physical activity because, again, we have that difference between our patients and, um, you know, this indigenous population. And out of that 72% carbohydrate, a lot of it was fiber. 
within the ketogenic diet, you know, when you think about the difficulty in doing um, a randomized controlled trial with a blind arm of being on a diet, it's very difficult to blind somebody to being on a ketogenic diet. They pretty much would know that, okay, I am consuming all of this butter or oil or cream. And so it's been difficulty in the epilepsy community to replicate, um, you know, a gold standard of research. And so we often have um, different uh, mentions of uh, rodent studies, um, which I'm going to mention. And you see that used heavily, that a lot of practitioners will say, well, this study in mice showed this. And really, we need to look a little bit deeper into so some of these studies, where it whether it is really applicable to humans. Um, biggest thing, you know, this last uh, end of the summer, looking at uh, the PURE study versus ERIC study, both studies which were really um, polarized in the media. Um, the PURE study concluded that a lower carb diet was um, associated with a lower mortality. And the ERIC study concluded that um, the, the lower carb diet, you know, was not associated with a lower mortality. At first, it looked like they were really on different ends of the spectrum. And it actually um, turns out that, you know, both of them were saying that the longest lo longevity was around a carbohydrate consumption of approximately 50% of calories. So uh, Pure was saying around 46% um, carbs, and the um, Eric was saying more like 50, 55. So they actually were saying around the same amounts, but when you saw the headlines in the media, they were really pushing them like, low carb diet will kill you, and high carb diet is this. And it really was not an accurate representation of the research. So I mentioned, you know, uh, thinking about um, this mix of rodent studies being in along with human studies, and I wanted to point one out uh, why this is concerning, at least to me, to base my recommendations on uh, some of these studies. Uh, this was a study that was just published um, EPUB in August from the Journal of Physiology. And they actually, in this study, they had um, three groups of mice that were fed either a standard chow, uh, which was, you know, a mixed macronutrient uh, chow. They had a ketogenic diet chow, or they had a chow that was excessive calories and excessive fat. So it was a high-fat chow, but it's also obesogenic chow that was um, extra calories. So the ketogenic mice um, and the rest of the mice, they were fed their particular diet for three days, and then they were challenged after a fasting period with a glucose tolerance test. And the results of this study um, showed that the ketogenic mice and the high-fat uh, diet mice did have an increase in hepatic insulin resistance, um, and they had some glucose intolerance. Their blood sugars were not actually in the range that they were considered to have diabetes. But this insulin resistance was um, you know, cited as an issue. And um, I do a lot of media work uh, for the Academy of Nutrition. And so because I specialize in keto, I was, um, I was asked for a quote um, on this study. And, you know, I said this research is interesting, but the study period was only examined for over three days. And while the study showed insulin resistance, it actually did not show that the mice had type 2 diabetes. And I said a headline that concludes a ketogenic diet will cause type 2 diabetes is not supported. And who wants to guess what the headline was for this article? Ketogenic diet may increase risk for type 2 diabetes. And really, when we look at the impact of a ketogenic diet on the blood sugar levels, what we can measure acutely, we, we have low or very low blood sugar levels when we're consuming a diet that's made up of fat. So I delve a little bit deeper into this study. And this was news to me. I've never worked as a researcher with rodents. If you have, you may already know this information I'm going to show you. Um, but in the diet where the mice were given the ketogenic diet, their diet was 97% of calories from fat. Now, that would almost be physically impossible for an adult because you would not be able to meet any of the other macronutrient needs you need for health. You would not be able to meet protein. So the, there should not be anybody consuming 97% of calories from fat. But what the diet was made up of is really concerning for me. 
this diet was entirely made up of Crisco. So these rats had almost the entire bulk of their diet was vegetable shortening, hydrogenated fat. So that is a high intake of trans fatty acids, and they had a little bit of corn oil to prevent any essential fatty acid deficiencies. So they literally were fed nothing but Crisco. I don't have any, my patients on the ketogenic diet that are fed nothing but Crisco. And we do know that trans fatty acids themselves have been shown to increase hepatic insulin resistance. So to make that leap from, you know, what these rats were fed for three days into headlines, I had patients that followed the diet for seizures terrified that this was going to happen to their child or this was going to happen to themselves. And certainly that leap to those headlines, you know, it's not justified. But that was eye-opening for me. I did not know that ketogenic diets for these um, rodents were made up of entirely Crisco, but I guess this is standard practice. So sometimes when we talk, think about people trying a ketogenic diet, especially on, on their own, I often hear um, healthcare professionals give warnings to people. You know, you are going to get uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. You are going to end up in the hospital, and you are going to be so acidotic. And so one of the things that I've tried to do as a healthcare, healthcare professional is talk about the differences in these two states. And really when we look at, someone being in ketosis, any human that does not have a metabolic disorder will enter ketosis if there's not enough food. This is our backup natural hybrid system so that in the past, in ancestral humans, when food was not available, this is a way that the body supports itself until they can get more carbohydrate or more protein or more fat. So when carbohydrates are restricted or unavailable to cells, as in the case of DKA, there is an increased mobilization of fatty acids from our own adipose tissues. So you would be in, begin to break down fat, um, you know, if, if there's no fat coming in um, orally. And in the liver, fatty acids are converted to ketones uh, through the mitochondria. While the brain can't use fatty acids as, as an energy source, it is a unique ability to use ketones. And in the epilepsy community, we often see improvements in brain function. Uh, for many of the children or adults, you know, the adults can say, I feel less brain fog. I have better word-finding abilities. And for children, we see increased ability to speak, increased ability to consume food by mouth, increased ability to walk at times. And so you're actually seeing brain function as seizures are repressed um, actually improve in some circumstances. And so during ketosis, uh, once someone has entered that, we do have the presence of three major ketone bodies, which would be acetoacetate, um, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and then we have acetone, uh, which is exhaled. Um, the major energy source for the body and the brain would be the acetoacetate and the beta-hydroxybutyrate. When we look at nutritional ketosis versus ketoacidosis, there are some major differences. The American Diabetes Association designates DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis as a blood sugar level greater than 250. They also designate that there should be presence of ketones in the serum, in the blood, or in the urine, and that acidosis should be present as determined by a serum bicarb of less than 18 or, and or a pH level of less than 7.3. And so when we look at somebody in nutritional ketosis, are they having all these side effects that we would see in DKA? So one of the major differences is that in DKA, we have life-threatening levels of blood glucose. And many of the other side effects that we see occurring are because of that issue happening. In nutritional ketosis, um, you know, an adult that's following a ketogenic diet might be perf perfectly fun functional, and their blood sugar is 50. And they're not having any hypoglycemic symptoms, which they should be monitoring for. But typically, we're not seeing elevated levels of blood glucose. It's not being produced, um, you know, in response to a meal. Um, when we look at that, many of the factors we see under DKA are caused by the high glucose level, which we would not see in just nutritional ketosis. 
there's no insulin on board, so that does lead to really ketone levels continuing to raise higher and higher and go unchecked. Because of the high levels of ketone bodies, which being an acid themselves, we, you know, we have a reduced pH. So again, the pH would continue to fall if this is not, if this whole process isn't stopped. There was a small study that actually looked at this issue among people on a ketogenic diet, and they actually found that they had no significant acid-base issues. They were non-diabetic patients following a ketogenic diet for weight loss, and this was a specific study um, that they were looking at how, what level of acidity do they have? Do they have an acid-base issue? And in that study, they really showed no difference in that, no significant difference. In DKA, we'd see a significantly elevated anion gap, no change in someone just on a ketogenic diet, and serum ketone levels would rise upwards of 15 to 25 millimoles. So we would have those excessive levels of ketones, very acidotic. For nutritional ketosis, you know, when someone reaches ketone levels of 0.5, that is considered being in a state of ketosis. But um, based on results from McKenzie, they looked at the average um, average ketone level for individuals on a ketogenic diet, and they typically would vary from 0.5 to 3. Now, I work with therapeutic ketogenic diets for seizures um, or for migraines, and so we often are trying to get our clients upwards of levels of 5, and it's actually very difficult. You know, adults, you know, it, it tends to range around 3, uh, closer to those higher levels. So you're not going to have somebody that does not have diabetes reaching those levels of 15 to 25 that you would see in DKA. And I think that's a misperception that people think that someone that doesn't have diabetes can reach excessive ketone levels. Obviously, it should be monitored, but it's not really typical. So how do we assess whether the low-carb diet is a right fit for our patients? Um, one thing, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, in our first presentation, thinking about what is the choice of the patient, you know, I think that's the best place to start because even if somebody is not well informed about what they should be doing for their body, their motivation to try something, you know, may help that work a little bit longer than having them use something they're not interested in. But I would really look at their tolerance of carbohydrates at this current level. What's their fasting insulin level? You know, are they fighting to break down those carbohydrates? They're in a pre-diabetic state. Do they have a lot of cravings? Would they eat a whole um, bowl of pasta and then crave sweets or crave chocolate or crave desserts? You know, are they having difficulty breaking those carbohydrates down? What's their A1C? You know, would it be a benefit for them to reduce, you know, the major um, contributor to the high glucose levels? And of course, looking at their current uh, lipid levels at baseline, um, we want to see where they're at. Even if that's normal, this can have unpredictable effects on someone's um, lipid panel at, th at three months out, you know, when we want to check that again. Have they had any malabsorptive weight loss procedure? Because as I'm going to touch on, you know, the ketogenic diet has issues in meeting micronutrient needs. So we have a couple issues if somebody has had a malabsorptive weight loss procedure like gastric bypass, are they already um, low in certain micronutrients? Are they going to tolerate a diet that is 80% fat? Can they break that down without becoming sick? Do they still have their gallbladder? Was that automatically removed with their um, RUNY? Was the gallbladder removed for some other reason? People typically do not feel the best, especially if they have bile reflux or any other condition where eating a lot of fat makes them feel, you know, just awful, um, whether they have diarrhea or any issue from this excessive fat. Are they taking any medications that are contraindicated with um, use of a ketogenic diet? And um, the SGL2 inhibitors, um, like Invokana, there was a, a, an article published by Kaura that said use of those medications concurrently with a ketogenic diet can actually lead to a euglycemic um, diabetic ketoacidosis. 
So those are not recommended. But most things, you know, we, this is an area where we don't really have good practice guidelines. We don't have great practice guidelines for a low-carb diet, but then matching up what meds should we DC, what meds should we monitor, what meds we should use, that really is an up-and-coming um, practice. A lot of it's just conjecture from doctors that are working in this area. Is there significant constipation? For pediatric patients that I work with, you know, we, we advise parents to have Miralax available right from the get-go. But there are some people, and especially if you have adults that are willing to eat some of the higher fiber foods that I'm going to go over, you may not have an issue. But it is something that people need to be made aware of prior to starting the diet. But it is possible to get a good amount of fiber um, on such a low-carb diet. And are they active? Are they an active person? You know, th we do have some, you know, people that are working towards increasing their level of activity. And depending on what they do, uh, you know, fueling this way, fueling on fat, it can have certain uh, impact on certain activities, especially if it's, you know, not that we would have it in this circumstance. But sometimes I've had someone come to me that's a boxer, and they want to do a ketogenic diet. Well, a boxer relies on stored carbohydrate as glycogen in their muscles. You know, you're going to actually hurt your performance by doing that kind of diet. So if somebody's really active individual, they can certainly try this, but they need to know that they might have some changes in their ability to perform certain types of exercise. And I had mentioned already, any pre-existing micronutrient deficiency should be assessed um, from the get-go prior to the diet being started. Now, I'm old enough that I went through, uh, I was practicing as a dietitian when the Atkins diet came out in the late 90s, and all the physicians I work with, all the nurses, all the patients, everybody was trying it. And obviously, if it worked... You know, 20 years later now, we wouldn't be having the same issue we did, right? But um, one of the things that struck me, you know, you think about use of this diet or any diet. The diet that people stay on is the diet that is most effective. And I had a gentleman back, um, you know, back around that time that um, he was, um, his weight was above 400 pounds. And he and his wife were both our, our patients for different reasons. And he went on a cruise while following the Atkins diet, very low-carb diet. And he was so excited because he came back from the cruise and he said, I ate plate after plate after plate of food, and I still lost 10 pounds. Well, what's the issue there? You know, this person needs to be referred to talk about whether there is a binge eating issue. Because when you look at the ketogenic diet, if somebody is suffering from emotional eating, binge eating, stress eating, or lack of physical activity, eating this way will not address those concerns. And the minute that their willpower to keep following this declines, all of those issues will come back in. And so that definitely needs to be addressed concurrently. Um, and that's why I think when you talk to especially a lot of dietitians, um, you know, most dietitians feel like a diet should be something sustainable. And I, I've heard a lot of people say this is not sustainable, it's not a magic fix, it's not maintainable. And so I'm going to mention there at the end um, just some ways that we possibly can um, help people to transition over to something a little bit more sustainable, but still maintain any progress that they've actually um, been successful with. So when we think about, um, I, I think the term that is often used now is, what is a well-planned ketogenic diet? Because certainly we can have people saying they're on keto and they're just pulling pepperoni and cheese off a of pizza and just eating that. And that is not a well-planned ketogenic diet. So a well-planned ketogenic diet should be based on whole foods. Um, up under the um, title, for some reason, you can see that there are animal products there, chicken, beef, eggs, pork, venison, turkey, fatty fish. Um, typically, you'll see some, some type of uh, meat product like that used at every meal. The diet does re it, do it doesn't have to be uh, dairy, but many people enjoy having uh, butter, heavy cream, natural hard or soft cheeses, full-fat yogurt in limited amounts because there's naturally lactose in yogurt. 
cream cheese ricotta. It is recommended that people on a ketogenic diet do consume green leafy vegetables at every meal and also include low carb vegetables not exceeding with those uh, the carbohydrate guidelines. Nuts, uh, macadamia are the highest in fat and um, almonds would be a little bit lower. Peanuts are the highest in protein. So all nuts can be included. And then seeds like chia, flax, pumpkin, that group right there is a great source of insoluble fiber and some soluble fiber. So definitely something that uh, we like for patients to include. There's a lot of extra fat added to the diet. So when we look at sauces, often made out of olive oil, coconut oil, avocado, uh, flaxseed oil. These are typically included at every meal in some, uh, in some aspect. Condiments, you know, especially people are not able to use a lot of different condiments that would contain sugar, French dressing versus ranch or ketchup. Um, but they can use a lot of herbs, salt, pepper, different things to flavor their food. And it actually is recommended that patients on a ketogenic diet do salt their food. Sufficient fluid intake is also very important, and I have a slide that I'm going to touch on that. So when we think about whether a ketogenic diet can be awful, you know, in terms of health, or can it contain some of the foods we're recommending that people eat, uh, this is a sample day uh, for an adult where the person might have an omelet with avocado, um, a little bit of a low-sugar salsa, peppers, spices. Maybe they would have a cup of black coffee or coffee with cream. Lunch might be a stir fry that does not can contain a grain. So they may have chicken, broccoli, bamboo shoots, mushrooms made in some type of oil and added nuts uh, to the top of that. Snacks can be lots of different things. And there's products coming out every day that fit for a lot of people. Many people make their own snacks, but they may have nuts, um, you know, celery sticks and guac, uh, chia pudding, cheese cubes. Um, and dinner might be chicken stuffed with pesto and cream, um, a spinach salad with lots of olive oil and vinegar. Um, I, as a dietitian that looks at what people eat and look at the micronutrient content, I don't recommend that a vegan diet is combined with a ketogenic diet for a couple different reasons. And that's why you're going to see that most of these meals do include uh, sources of animal protein. And I'll mention that on another slide. Because this such, is such a low-carb diet, you know, a lot of people ask about what artificial, what artificial sweetener should I use. And um, I work pretty closely with the Charlie Foundation, a nonprofit that promotes the use of the ketogenic diet. If you've never been on their website, they have a lot of videos from different experts in keto uh, from some of their international symposiums, and they have several of the videos you can watch on the Charlie Foundation website. And they, they really don't recommend a lot of use of artificial sweeteners on the diet, especially aspartame can be a seizure or migraine trigger for many people. Um, you know, obviously it is approved by the FDA as safe for consumption, but individual uh, choices, you know, I always try to respect how somebody feels that it, it interacts with their own body. It's important to really emphasize that natural sweeteners contain carbs. Um, I even had a family once that they rubbed honey on their child's G-tube site, and she was on the ketogenic diet through her feeding tube, and we couldn't understand why didn't she have any ketones. And it was absorbed, you know, through the skin. So when we think about use of that, you know, use of different type of sugars, agave nectar, coconut sugar, these need to be, um, you know, thoroughly educated that they're not, not a great choice if you want to remain in ketosis. For sugar alcohols, sugar alcohols are, you know, kind of their own breed of um, a food product. It is an alcohol that tastes sweet. And so you'll see these names uh, listed as sorbitol, erythritol, glycerol, and they do actually affect ketosis. They also can have significant effects on GI health. So that's why the sugar-free chocolates say excess consumption of these can cause a laxative effect on the back of the package. So for these, um, it actually, if you have somebody you're working with that has type 1 diabetes, and they're really counting their carbohydrates closely, 
it's recommended that sugar alcohols are counted as half as much as carbs. So if it's on the label and it says six grams of sugar alcohol, people with type 1 diabetes should count it as three grams of carbohydrates. So these are somewhat in a category of its own. They do affect blood sugar and they can negate ketosis if someone's trying to maintain that. And um, stevia and also saccharin um, is approved for patients' use. Um, that is not found to affect ketosis and not thought to cause cancer in laboratory animals. So I mentioned these um, kind of interchangeably, but I wanted to talk about, you know, when you're discussing what a ketogenic diet is, what makes a low-carb diet keto? You know, and th really the difference would be whether the carbohydrates are lowered enough so that someone is in a ketogenic state. And so the traditional ketogenic diet, which comes from the epilepsy community, is calculated in a ratio. And you may see a ratio listed of 4 to 1, 3 to 1, 2 to 1, and that actually represents on the larger side, the 4 to 1, 4 would be the fat. So there's really four more fat units compared to every unit of carb and protein. So the carb plus the protein is on the other side of the ratio. So they have to be balanced out in order to have that, um, have that mathematical ratio. Just to be aware, because um, I see this in magazine articles all the time, you know, they'll say like adults can be on a four to one ratio on a ketogenic diet, and that's not actually true. When you do the mathematics, um, if you think about like an Atkins diet, an Atkins diet is really around a one to one ketogenic ratio or up to a two to one. An adult, because of needing to meet their protein needs, adults can't really be on a four to one diet. It's not mathematically possible. That's something that's used in children. Um, but typically, um, we also have the MCT oil diet. Now, MCT oil is often added to a ketogenic diet, and it's not that particular diet, so I wanted to mention that. But the traditional MCT oil diet, which is used for seizures, 50% of the calories in that diet just comes from MCT oil. So the families are literally, you know, drinking oil. You would have to drink oil to get up to that high amount. Um, but MCT oil has benefits in raising uh, levels of ketones in the blood, and that's why it's often used in, if you know, bulletproof coffee or any type of diet where people are using MCT oil, the way that it's metabolized has a, an increasing effect on ketosis. So modified Atkins diet, very similar to the Atkins diet, um, low glycemic index diet, these are the names of the different four ketogenic diets used in the epilepsy community, and many of that yeah, has filtered over to use in the general population. And so typically on a modified Atkins diet, an adult would be having um, 20 to 40 grams of carb per day. With low glycemic index diet, people can increase that to 50 to 60 grams of carb per day by only choosing low GI carbs, and they're still able to maintain ketosis. And obviously, these carbs are spread out. If you would eat 50 carbs at once, you would negate ketosis. So this is, you know, instructed that this has to be spread out throughout the day. Who's, uh, can I see a raise, um, show of hands? Who's currently um, restricting their patients to that level of carbohydrates, like less than 40? So, good. You know, it's, it's definitely something that's being used more commonly. Um, and when we think about that level, um, let me see if I can point over there. The standard American diet is around 50 to 70% carbohydrate. And if you look at a diet, like we said, where it's 40 grams of carb per day, that's only 5 to 10% carbohydrate. It would be 60 to 65% fat and 25 to 35% protein. So it's typically, you know, a, a normal intake of protein. Um, with low glycemic index, as I said, they can go a little bit higher on the carbs, but they must only use certain types of carbs. And in the MCT oil diet, 50% of the calories comes just from MCT oil. I wanted to, I know you probably can't see this in the back, but I wanted to show you really how a diet is calculated when it's calculated in a ratio. Uh, this would only be used with a child because of the extent of the control. 
Um, this is um, a program that's called the Keto Diet Calculator. It was created by a dietitian uh, who works for the Charlie Foundation. And you can see that here, this is a meal that's breakfast sausage uh, with fruit. Uh, they're using the Jones Dairy Farm sausage, which is why it says that. The meal is actually 320 calories on a four to one ratio. That would mean that the goal is that within those calories at a four to one ratio, you would have 32 grams of fat, 6.6 .6 grams of protein, and only 1.4 grams of carb. That's like a toast crumb. So you're obviously not fitting in rice, toast, grains. Very little fruit can fit in even. And as you see the breakdown, this has to be weighed on a gram scale. 24 grams of heavy cream would be approximately an ounce. 10 grams of raspberries would be approximately a teaspoon. 39 grams of sausage might be a link and a half. Um, one gram of oil. Um, pretty, that's a pretty small amount. And then eight grams of MCT oil, which would be a little bit more than a tablespoon. I think there's five mLs in a tablespoon. Um, so this then typically is mixed into something up here. They might mix it in the cream and the person might drink it with a straw or sprinkle it on their food. And so that's the extreme of ketogenic diet. Anybody glad you don't go to that extreme with your patients on the diet? <laughs> So the only way that that can be done is really through a computer program. Now, the reason we don't do that for adults, obviously, is because, you know, compliance-wise. Now, for some of my clients that do, are doing this to suppress seizures, they, they do go to this extreme because they want that consistent level of ketones. With obesity um, management, we really wouldn't be striving for that extent of controlled ketones at all times. Because at this point, you know, we really don't know is there a correlation do our patients need to be in ketosis in order to have the same benefits of weight loss? That's still an unknown in using a ketogenic diet for obesity treatment. But one thing I wanted to point out, you know, if you're not familiar, as dietitians, we study as part of our undergraduate training food science. So we study all the foods and what their micronutrients are so that when someone tells us, I'm allergic to this, we know what is then missing from the diet. So I wanted to point out some of the concerns in thinking about is, can you have a high quality ketogenic diet with eliminating all of these carbohydrate foods? So I'm going to use an example that really can't be fit into a ketogenic diet in this um, extent. And that would be um, 100 calories of mango. So 100 calories of mango would be one small mango. If we look at the micronutrients provided by this mango, the mango provides a lot of different micronutrients that can protect against cancer, that can support our immune system. And so this small mango would meet 7% of our potassium needs, 26% of our copper needs, 19% of our vitamin B6, 100% of vitamin C needs just in that small mango, 12% of vitamin E, and 22% of folate. So we have a wide spectrum of different micronutrients provided by this type of plant. Now, when we look at the ketogenic diet, because it is made up of 80% of the calories from fat, we don't have the same micronutrient content in those foods. So comparing 100 calories of butter, which is used often by people on the ketogenic diet, Micronutrient-wise, what do we get? We have really nothing. So we've substituted 100 calories of butter. We're getting fat as a macronutrient, but we're not really getting the micronutrients. And so we have a little bit of vitamin A. That's it. Everything else on the slide is 0 or 1%. So when you think about nutrients of concern, if you do have a patient come in and they say to you, you know, I, I've been on this diet six months, I didn't take a vitamin, you know, there are some nutrients of concern because they're not naturally available within this diet. So despite the fact that a well-planned ketogenic diet can contain whole foods, there's still nutrients of concern. You want to consider checking a CBC, folate, B12, um, calcium, just because it's going to come in the panel, but it's obviously not a uh, reflective uh, measurement of the dietary calcium. Uh, vitamin D, zinc, and magnesium levels. And this should be checked prior to a diet initiation. But again, you, you have this patient, they're coming in, their weight loss is stalling. These different nutrients need to be assessed. 
It's important to include with a ketogenic diet a full spectrum multivitamin that has at least 80 to 100% of the DRI for the nutrients because it's likely, especially you know, it's not a well-planned diet. They do need to have some type of micronutrient supplementation and that should contain selenium, iron if it's a menstruating woman, uh, magnesium, zinc, and I really don't recommend that individuals try to do a vegan diet uh, while pairing that with ketogenic. If you go on Facebook, you can join a group with 40,000 people that are doing that. But typically, you're going to be then cutting out more sources of minerals that are not going to be re replaced by what's being included. A protein powder that's been synthesized and doesn't have micronutrients is not going to replace what's provided by having an egg as a part of the diet. And so if they are doing the vegan version, they should also be looked at uh, for deficiencies of lysine, choline, iron, B12. And it's good if you have a registered dietitian in your practice. One of the things that I like to do is I have my patients track their self-intake uh, through a website that's called Chronometer. And they can actually see what their micronutrient intake is. And then we match it up. If they're doing great on their calcium and they have 75% coming in from the diet, I'm not going to add 1,000 milligrams of calcium on, calcium on top of that because that does have a risk for um, adverse effects. For electrolyte provisions, it is important to uh, let people know that some of the signs of going over into ketosis, what's often called the keto flu, where people have nausea, headaches, fatigue, dizziness, this can be helped by proper electrolyte supplementation from day one. So making sure that they're consuming enough salt, potassium, and magnesium. Average recommendation for adults uh, using a ketogenic diet, they should be supplementing enough salt to be getting 3,000 to 5,000 milligrams of sodium per day. Now, considering the fact that only 25% of Americans are salt sensitive, you know, we have a wide, um, right now, wide net of recommendations for lowering sodium. This is a very individual uh, situation. And so you can use um, a light salt, which provides potassium, but it's best to encourage those five servings of low-carb vegetables every day that will meet the potassium intake. That would be a much better broad spectrum way to get the potassium. If you do have uh, someone who has muscle cramps, uh, you can supplement with magnesium. Initial recommendation is 300 to 500 milligrams of magnesium per day. And um, I saw, um, as I was doing some uh, prep for the talk, you know, obviously there's a concern if you have someone with extremely high blood pressure, they're on multiple meds for their blood pressure, um, they're on a diuretic. And so they had recommended that, you know, you can uh, limit their sodium to less than uh, 3 grams, 3,000 milligrams a day, and assess how their blood pressure and their fluid retention is changing uh, prior to removing uh, a diuretic or addressing how they're progressing once you see that fact. Um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, before we um, finish up is the fact that um, in a lot of the studies that we're looking at um, low carb versus low fat, you want to be aware that a lot of times in the low carb arm, they did not restrict the calories um, for those people. And the reason they did that is because in most of the lay uh, diet plans, the Atkins or South Beach diet, they don't restrict the total calorie intake. So they replicated that in some of the studies. And so this is really a benefit sometimes for someone that you may be able to allow them to eat to satiety um, and be on a higher calorie level than being restricted to 800 or 1,000 or 1,200 calories, you may initiate at a higher level. Um, so some um, experts in this area, you know, encourage people not even to count their calories when they're doing low carb. Uh, I'm not quite there, you know, uh, uh, on the fence about that because most of the time people are going to be using a tracker anyways. They're going to be using my fitness pal or the chronometer. It's good to uh, give somewhat of a calorie idea, not necessarily a limit and not necessarily a goal, 
but just trying to get them in a range that we would expect that you want to be around this goal just so that in the future you have an easier time adjusting the diet because if you have no idea what their calorie intake was it's much more difficult to adjust what they're doing to try to help them have success with their weight loss because you can out eat the effects of a ketogenic diet that's the goal in children we would just give them more fat and calories and they would continue to gain weight so it's not a magic way to lose weight but often the feeling of satiety and suppressing hunger does um, help but I I'll put in the slide uh, what the current guidelines are thinking about calculating calorie needs and then trying to communicate that to a patient and calculating their carbohydrate goal in grams not a percentage of calories because if you tell someone okay you need 10 percent of your calories as carbs and they're eating 4,000 calories they're never going to be in ketosis because it has to be under a certain number of grams so when it comes to advising on how many grams of protein and carb that we're putting patients on we need to prescribe that in grams not a percentage of calories the same thing with protein needs, um, you know, current for the dietary guidelines, they recommend 0.8 grams per kilo. For a ketogenic diet, it should not be high protein, it should be high fat. And so the calculated protein needs are 1.2 to 1.7 grams of protein based on an adjusted body weight. And that's not necessarily a high protein diet. It's a moderate meet the needs protein diet because otherwise if it's excessively high, they will not be in as much of a ketosis as if we're using a lot of fat. Does anyone have their patients monitor ketones? You know, and I think that, you know, an area of obesity treatment, there's no guidelines, you know, necessarily to do it or to not. Um, you can measure by a serum ketones, which we use in epilepsy, urine ketones, or breath ketones, which do not have parameters of where that should be in terms of uh, medical use. Um, but for someone that has had significant lows uh, prior, they should be checking their blood sugar. Um, I'd have to say, you know, one benefit uh, if you are um, checking ketones in the urine would just to be uh, patient motivation because patients feel like something's happening. So sometimes people like to do it because they're so proud that their stick is purple or whatever it would be. So it's a motivator for some people. Or when they screw up and they test it, they see the um, effects of that. But we actually don't know how the degree of ketosis affects um, the ability to lose weight. And so in some of the research done by Verta Health, you know, they found that their average um, ketosis or BHB levels were really very mild and individuals in this study that were restricted to 30 grams of carb per day for a year they still had an average weight loss of 3.8 kilos they decreased their um, use of insulin their fasting insulin levels triglyceride levels inflammatory markers and while both the HDL and LDL bumped a little it was not considered significantly um, a, a factor in that and their serum creatinine and liver enzymes all declined so you know we still don't know is there a level of ketosis that benefits weight loss um, we still don't really know that but this was interesting to see that it was pretty mild ketosis and they had good results still with that it is encouraged to have adequate fluids um, ketogenic diet sometimes has been pointed to as a kidney stone risk factor but Dr. Eric Kossoff, who is an international expert in the ketogenic diet at Johns Hopkins, really has felt that in the past, medications like Topamax were really the cause of some of the key kidney stones that they saw with the ketogenic diet. And so normally those are discouraged from use during the diet. And having sufficient fluids is very important, um, especially for... Um, you know, if you ever work with someone that is a child that has to do a ketogenic diet, um, inadequate fluids can lead to nausea and it can lead to vomiting, which of course then you're not maintaining. A diet that you don't eat doesn't work, right, if they can't even get the diet down. So adequate fluids is important for everyone. For supporting bone health, um, you know, they found that excess protein load is not as detrimental as what was thought. 
Um, but again, we want to avoid over calcium supplementation. We want to match that up to the diet. So it is really important to supplement vitamin D and calcium, but not excessively. Many of the sources that Americans consume for calcium are eliminated when it comes to the ketogenic diet. So whole milk, um, flavored milk, grain-based dishes, pizza, tortillas, fortified juice, ice cream products, all of those have to go. You can't have those. So we really have to have good knowledge of the sources of calcium on a ketogenic diet, but then really a, a supplement is often needed in a small dose to match up to what's missing in the diet. All right, I know I'm a little bit over, so I think you'll be interested in this slide, though. Um, when we look at this complaint about fiber, lack of fiber in the diet, these are some ways that if you're working with someone and you want to have them adhere to the diet, not be constipated, get enough fiber, let's picture that person that is consuming 10 grams of carb per meal. Now that 10 grams of carb can subtract fiber, so we don't count fiber into that carb count. And so when we look at some options that people can have, with 10 cups of carb, you could actually have two cups of cherry tomatoes in a meal. Now, two cups of cherry tomatoes is a lot. That would only be 11.7 grams of carb and 3.6 grams of fiber. How about chia? Chia is really something that's often used on a ketogenic diet. And an ounce of chia is 12.4 grams of carb, but 10.7 of that is fiber. So this would actually only, if you're carb counting up to 10, an ounce of chia would only count as 1.7 grams of net carb, and you get 10 grams of fiber. And an ounce of chia has 179 milligrams of calcium. How about for baby spinach? A person could actually spend their 10 grams of carb and eat 12 cups of baby spinach. We know no one's probably going to do that, right? But that actually is only 5.2 grams of carb, and they get 7.9 grams of fiber. How about an avocado? A whole avocado would provide 9.2 grams of fiber, but only 2.6 grams of net carb. Radishes are also a good choice. You could have an entire daikon radish, 11 ounces of radish. It's a pretty big radish. I don't know how you'd want to cook that. But when we look at that, that would only be 7.8 grams of net carb. Green peppers, also two and a half cups of green peppers, you know, in that meal would provide 3.9 grams of fiber. And if you ate all the way up to as many carbs as you could with subtracting the net carbs, you could get 6.3 grams of plant fiber at that meal. These are the biggie ones that I really think are funny. So who likes to eat beet greens? They're, they're good cooked in a little non-nitrate uh, bacon if you're a fan. Um, but one cup of beet greens only has 8 calories, 1.6 grams of carb, and 1.4 grams of that is fiber. So somebody actually could consume 50 cups of beet greens at a meal, one meal. Great source of dietary nitrate for their uh, blood pressure. And the last one is sprouts. So when we look at that, a cup of sprouts the person actually could consume 25 cups of sprouts um, at that single meal using their 10 grams of carbs. So there are ways to get fiber. Um, it was great. We already talked about um, some of the uh, risk factors with cancer. And that's where we do get concerned with the fact that some beneficial foods are reduced so low. Whole grains, you know, it's been shown that in that most recent report that up to 90 grams of whole grains per day reduce risk of colon cancer by 17%. And you can't fit that in on a ketogenic diet. So we still don't know how is eating like this going to have negative, positive, long-term effects on our microbiome, despite the fact we're using whole foods. They're not in a way that, you know, the research has really looked at in terms of these long-term outcomes. So these are the things that really need to be monitored. You know, if you have a patient that, you know, is doing this diet, you're doing this in your practice, they should be working with a primary care physician and a knowledgeable registered dietitian. We want to monitor liver function tests, complete metabolic profile, and the diet can be deficient in every nutrient besides B12. 
be, if they're eating the meat. Um, so we want to really make sure that they're supplementing with potassium, sodium, magnesium, selenium, B vitamins, and vitamin C. And yes, I did have a child once that got scurvy on the diet, and she was sub supplemented. And then carnitine is often monitored if someone is really um, on the diet for an extensive uh, number of time, or they're trying to do a vegan version, and the carnitine panel can be run and then supplemented if necessary. Looking at the effects on cardiovascular risk factors, um, you know, we want to monitor. You know, we see some benefits in um, raising HDL. We see some problems with the LDL going up. Um, and so if you have a patient that you really have a lipid panel back and it is significantly high, there are some things that you can do. Um, you can encourage a wide variety of fats from both animal and plant sources. So more monounsaturated fat, some polys, but just having that mix of different sources of fat. Making sure they're including sources of omega-3 fats, fatty fish, uh, sometimes using an omega-3 uh, fatty acid supplement. Trying to increase soluble fiber, like the chia, ground flax, would be a good way to get more fiber in. And then also make sure the patient was fasting. I had a young girl once that she wasn't fasting, and her triglyceride was 725. So, you know, we found out it was because she wasn't fasting before the, the lab was drawn. So make sure that. And uh, some experts also see that you're going to get a different level if the patient refrains from eating eggs for a few days before the panel. You will sometimes get a different result. So sometimes that's recommended, too, just to see what the difference is. Um, and that's just from um, people that have been working with ketogenic diet for uh, many years. I'm going to skip uh, results from the epilepsy community. We know that this works, but it's very hard to stick to. And so my last slide here is, you know, in thinking about how do we um, help people adhere to this. Um, the Charlie Foundation for Epilepsy has an excellent diet that they call the Step 2 Diet. It's a very low-sugar diet based on whole foods, eliminates a lot of the foods that as you get into a real ketogenic diet, you wouldn't be having a lot of anyways. And it's available on their website, and it has pictures of the different foods. It's a really nice handout. And then I would really recommend setting a start date with your patients for full diet initiation. Make sure they have their supplements. They have their recipes. They know how to deal with, you know, Aunt Joe's pumpkin pie that's going to be sitting there. And make sure that they're ready to implement at that date. And I also would consider setting an end date, you know, say we're, we're going to do this for 12 weeks. At 12 weeks, we're either going off of this onto something else, or if you like it, we're going to run the parameters to make sure you're still healthy and we can continue. Because I think that helps people to try to get through to a certain point rather than leaving it open-ended. If counseling can be uh, made available um, on dealing with the emotional eating, dealing with the holidays, that can improve diet adherence. And we want to try to plan for transition to a sustainable plan. Maybe it is going to be lower carb than what they were doing, but not as low as they started out. But we want to currently assess this and be open to what the patient wants to increase adherence. And the references are at the end when you get your slides, but sorry for going over a few minutes. It's a very, uh, a topic with a lot of different opinions in it. So we're going to probably do the Q, uh, Q and this has been a Dana Miller Video Network presentation.